relevant facts out for investors. Okay, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, um, at the at the time, I'm not sure if it stretches that far back. Actually, I think it started more in the 1960s. Um, there's something called the efficient markets hypothesis. Uh, I actually believe it came out of the University of Chicago, and um, that's really dependent upon the marketplace having all the information it needs to properly price securities. And the Securities Act of 1933 was the first ever along that path. The Securities and Exchange Act of 1934, on the next slide, uh, was the law that created the Securities and Exchange Commission, and it really set up all the reporting requirements. So one way of differentiating between the 33 Act and the 34 Act is that the 33 Act is about going public, and the 34 Act is about what happens after you're public. Okay? Uh, the 34 Act, I think most people would also say was better written than the 33 Act. You have to remember that in that presidential election of 1932, there was just a huge change in regulatory philosophy. All right? And after President Roosevelt got elected, there was a lot of legislation that was passed without too much thought being given to it. And so there's a lot of criticism of the 33 Act that was just simply not well structured. For example, it, um, it gave an exclusion about what didn't have to be public, you know, what could be private, rather than defining what had to be public. So in other words, if you take a look at the US marketplace today, overwhelmingly things are private, right? McDonald's franchises. I mean, think of all the private companies out there, right? Relatively few companies are public companies registered with the SEC. But the way the 1933 Act is written is it, it, it says, all right, well, here are a few exemptions for companies that can be private, assuming that everyone's going to be public, right? It was sort of the, the audacity of the, of the government. I, they were Democrats then, but they're a different type of a Democrat. But when they came in in, in 32, there was like, oh, well, now we're going to have everyone be registered with the SEC. And it just wasn't practical because most small businesses couldn't, couldn't afford the cost of being uh, registered with the SEC, even back then when it was much cheaper, even in relative terms, um, to be a, uh, being a public company. But still, the 33 Act was written with the assumption that almost everyone would be registered. So, um, so that was a problem with the 33 Act. The 34 Act was a little bit better written. And I'll leave you with some of the details here. You will see that there's click-throughs here, so you can go back and see the actual legislation. I'll click on this for you here briefly. And one of the things I'll point out to you, I don't know if anyone's actually read through federal, uh, uh, federal uh, laws before, but they are huge. They are huge. Okay? And I have worked for a brief time on Capitol Hill, and I will tell you there are actually departments within Congress of people that do nothing but write legislation. Probably more people here in New York are more familiar with uh, computer programmers, right? The guys that know how to do HTML coding. They're kind of like that in Washington, right? They're the guys that know the right terms to use. If you're using something here, you might be overriding a previous piece of legislation. So you'll have to say, all right, well, just, as it said in the 33 Act, but now we're expanding it in the 34 Act. It just goes on and on and on. So if you actually want to see what the enabling legislation is for the SEC, there it is. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. It's a good thing to look at for maybe 15 or 20 minutes just to understand you know, how the system works. Um, if you're a pilot, I'm sure you've gone back to the FARs, you know, which is that section of the US Code of Federal Regulations that deals with flying and the FAA. And sometimes you kind of want to go back to the enabling legislation and see exactly what you can or can't do, or in the case of the FARs, the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. Um, but it is a mess. And this is one of the reasons why you end up with so many lawsuits, because the law just isn't clear. So, as complicated as it is in the 33 and 34 Act, there is one part of those laws which is very clear. Okay? And that is the prohibition against fraud. All right? So up until now, we've kind of discussed the laws that define public equity. All right, now I want to take a look at those that apply to private equity. One of the things that you really want to focus on is, um, uh, well, it's Section 10B of the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934. And then to emphasize the point, the SEC passed uh, Rule 10B-5, which is in the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. And they both deal with the prohibition against fraud. Okay? 
So again, remember, the overriding principle here are these two laws, and Joseph Kennedy was the one who shepherded it through. He said, look, Washington wants to get on Wall Street. I just want to deal with facts, not with opinions. Okay? And when they wrote the piece of legislation, they said, fine, all right, we're not going to bust you for a bad opinion, but we will bust you for a bad fact. Okay? And so if you say, uh, for example, if you say that the CFO's brother is not the CEO of the competing company, right, or you fail to include that bit of material information, all right, and an investor invests in the company and loses all of his money, all right, and it turns out that it was obvious that this company was going to fail because the CFO is passing all the information off to his brother, who is head of the competing company, and you never disclose that, okay, in your filings with the SEC, that's fraud, okay? And the reason this is important for private equity is that these laws, with that law, Section 10B of the Securities Act of 1934, and that rule applies to private equity as well. Okay? So we're starting our little helicopter company, okay? And we're going to give people rides in the helicopter, and we want to buy another helicopter, and so we go out and we raise money. Uh, this is an excluded trans, uh, um, transaction. It's not filed with the SEC, okay? But we go out and we raise money, and we tell them that we're going to go buy um, a Eurocopter, a very expensive jet helicopter, okay? And it turns out that we take that money in and we end up buying a cheaper Robinson. And we've got all this money sitting around. We use that to go have a good time. All right? And the investors come back and they found out that they thought they were investing in a company that was going to have a better helicopter. And they ended up investing in a company and they got a worse helicopter. They'll sue. And we'll respond, well, well, wait a second. You can't sue us. We never registered this with the SEC. And they'll say, oh, read it. Securities Act of 1934, Section 10B, to use or employ in connection with the purchase or sale of any security registered on national security exchange or any security not so registered, you're busted. It is, I believe, the number one source of securities lawsuits in this country. I don't have a, a stat to back that up, but just reading the... the the um, lawsuits that come through the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or across that, the SEC has a section which just is their enforcement actions. Section 10B, or the SEC enforces 10B-5, which is a narrow interpretation of it. They make it very clear. If it's, even if it's private, you cannot deceive someone. Okay? So, you're going to uh, sell someone the Brooklyn Bridge, you violated Rule 10B-5. Okay? Now, let's say that what you really wanted to do was raise money for the Brooklyn Bridge Fund. This was a fund that was going to help, um, uh, there was a debate a few years ago about whether or not they were going to have the lights on on the Brooklyn Bridge because it cost too much money, right? So let's say you were going to do the Brooklyn Bridge Fund, okay? And you were raising money so you could always have the lights on on the Brooklyn Bridge, okay? And let's say that somebody um, gave money to this fund and then they turned around and said, well, I'm going to sue you. He said, why are you suing me? And the guy said, well, you told me you were going to sell me the Brooklyn Bridge. I said, no, no, we're just raising money for the Brooklyn Bridge Fund. And the guy says, that doesn't matter. I'm going to sue you unless you settle out of court. And this kind of stuff happens all the time. You pay me off or I'll take you to court. And I'm going to sue you under Section uh, SEC Rule 10b-5. All right? This is one of the reasons why we have PPMs, <coughs> Private Placement Memorandums. So when there is an exchange of money, you are making it very clear